Hello, everybody. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Marcos, Marcos Zachariadis, as you can see. So I'm a professor at the University of Manchester, and uh, we're here today with uh, my colleague, Pinar, Pinar Oskan, from the University of Oxford, to uh, talk a little bit about what we've been doing the last, uh, I guess, about four years in terms of research around open banking. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, kind of phenomenon for us because it touches upon some of the very interesting theories we have in economics and management. So um, our point of view for open banking is obviously not necessarily advising regulators how they should regulate, which was a very impressive presentation by Ismail and, and really interesting. We do have one project looking at uh, kind of a similar uh, approach to open banking, but for, for us to be here today, um, it's going to be more about the business model side, right? And what we call, uh, or, or strategy, if you want to call it strategy. Um, and again, so I'm going to start a little bit by presenting some basic and fundamental truths or some theories, if you want, uh, within the economics and management uh, about what uh, we, we basically observe in terms of the evolution of, of business models uh, within the technology sectors, but also across many different sectors. And one of them is certainly what we call the platform business model, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar. Uh, and then Pinar is going to talk a little bit about how open banking kind of ex encourages this kind of new breed of business models in banking. And we have some interesting observations as to how banks have been trying to utilize these new business models and whether they're coping or not. What are the issues and barriers and risks that you know, uh, take place while they're trying to do that? Um, so. And to motivate a little bit the talk, I guess, uh, one of the first of things that one could say is that, you know, obviously, platform business models are not new. Uh, there are several industries that we have seen platform business models play out, and this is just a table we're uh, borrowing from some coll colleagues at MIT, uh, colleagues of ours, um, that they, they put down some figures around fully integrated business models from incumbent companies in their own industries, uh, like BMW comparing to Uber, for example. And I know some of you might say, well, this is not kind of a fair comparison necessarily, but let's say that both companies take you from place A to, uh, to place B in terms of transportation. So Uber does it in a very integrated way. So they produce cars and then they sell cars so you can buy a car and move. Uh, but, uh, but Uber uh, does it in a, in a very different way. You can see the differences in terms of when they were founded, what's the market capitalization and how many uh, employees in terms of resources uh, they use. And the same comparison you can do roughly with different industries. Imagine Merit, for example, right? Very, very kind of incumbent organization in that sense, very integrated. So they have to build hotels, they have to resource hotels, they have to find people work at their hotels, and then they have to offer rooms. Airbnb kind of takes a slightly different approach. And I know a lot of you might have objections about you know, whether it's a fair comparison or not, but think about Airbnb, booking a hotel, you go online, uh, you know, lots of different kind of approaches on how they do that, where, where do they find the rooms, et cetera, compared to uh, Marriott. And you can go on talking about, you know, perhaps um, uh, the media business and comparing between Walt Disney and Facebook or maybe even, you know, photography in terms of uh, uh, digital photography and, uh, and kind of like older ways of, of uh, creating photographs, right? So we have Kodak is another kind of good example of a fully integrated company that kind of lost uh, uh, steam um, very recently, well, quite a few years ago and then almost went bankrupt, I think it might kind of exist in different form right now. Um, so I guess there are, um, you know, different kind of, uh, of ways to kind of think about platforms. Uh, one of the ways that it's been uh, uh, quite popular in the media, and I'm sure you have seen this quote going around, is uh, in terms of comparing these two genres of business models is like Uber is the world's ta largest taxi company, owns no vehicles, Facebook the largest kind of media company, uh, does not own any content, and Airbnb the same, the largest accommodation company provides, uh, provides and owns no real estate. So it kind of gives you some sense on where, where do they find these resources to offer to people. Now platforms, again, uh, they're not they're kind of like a, a, a new business model that we see emerging across many different industries, but certainly not new. Uh, they go uh, way back, and uh, we, we see these days, we see a lot of momentum of this kind of business model kind of playing out in many different industries. And you can see uh, companies that rank on the top 
uh, kind of most popular companies in terms of brand, for example, valuation. Uh, in 2006, we only used to have one platform business model kind of oriented company like Microsoft. Nowadays, we have like the largest companies in their all, the world, they're all operating in the platform-based business model. So now the question is what, what a platform is, and I'm sure you have many different kind of definitions in your head, but I'm gonna give you a, a very basic kind of academic definition, uh, if you want, uh, that will perhaps help us out play out some of the topics we're gonna discuss uh, and Pinar is gonna present a bit later. So the first thing that a platform business model does is basically reducing transaction costs, right? And we can think that in terms of, uh, for example, uh, if you want to, uh, uh, find a car, you know, uh, by hailing a taxi, you, you occur certain costs, right? So the first is search cost, for example. The second is, uh, you know, a transaction cost of the kind, negotiate the price perhaps, contractual costs maybe, uh, and then of course you have payment costs, right? And then you have, uh, you know, the, the uncertainty that you deal with when you're contracting with someone for economic relationship. Maybe the driver is not good, et cetera, and you have no mechanism to feed that back, you know, the quality of service that you're getting. But Uber takes all that, for example, with a very traditional platform business model and packages it into one kind of integrated solution that deals with these different transaction costs. So search costs you can deal with through, you know, the, the, the engine that it has to map and track cars, uh, payment to get very seamless, et cetera, uh, you have a contract of some kind, right? So you, there's accountability, you can write down your driver, et cetera. So all these are packed and integrated. Uh, so dealing with transaction costs. Um, and the second key benefit of platform business models is what we call network externalities. And I'm sure, again, you have seen that. Uh, in the context, for example, of, uh, uh, again, Airbnb, here's a good example for that. Uh, but what it means, uh, basically, is that uh, what we call network effects work in the way um, that, you know, the, the more, if you have a two-sided market, for example, you know, which is kind of the traditional sense of a platform, uh, the more kind of drivers you have on the Uber platform, uh, the more kind of people the Uber platform will attract, because then you have lower downtime, you have uh, um, kind of uh, better price competition, for example, etc. Now, as more people cluster on the, on, the, on the supply side, for example, on the demand side, sorry, uh, more supply side kind of users come in. So more taxes come in. And it's kind of a virtuous circle which gives a lot of benefit and increases a lot the valuation of the platform business model company, right? So these are kind of like a couple of observations in terms of the theory. And, you know, in full scale, I guess, the platform business model looks uh, more like this. So you have... Obviously the platform in the middle, which kind of does all the heavy lifting in terms of managing all these kind of relationships, et cetera, giving a certain amount of governance or monetizing, uh, again, these relationships, manages the openness, how open the platforms needs to be or closed, scalability, core technology, and of course standards in there as well. Um, and then you have, you know, the two sides. You have producers that come in, uh, and then you have consumers. And these are all the interrelationships and the network externalities that we see kind of being present usually in platform business models. Um, the last characteristic, I guess, before we start thinking around uh, how this kind of plays out in banking, and Pinar will uh, in one minute share you know, our findings in that context, um, is that you, you can take advantage of uh, not supply side economies of scale, that is the traditional kind of economic phenomenon we see in integrated business models, right? So the bigger the company, the cheaper it is to produce stuff. Uh, but we have demand side economies of scale, which is basically the value you give, you give your data or the, the data you get from the different sides to curate better or make your platform more efficient, right? It's kind of like a, a tweak in that uh, on how you see the economies of scale in that particular point. Uh, but this is kind of like another thing that uh, you can keep in mind as you and as Pinar kind of discussed a little bit how all these kind of applies or at least, uh, you know, the, based on the observations we had so far in the banking sector. So that's it for me. Um, and I'm going to pass on to Pinar who's going to kind of share some of these ideas uh, that we came up with. So it's not necessarily us telling you this is kind of the business model you should follow. But this is, you know, from observations we had, uh, this is, you know, kind of what we as academics see valuable in terms of open banking, in terms of openness in the banking sector, and how it played out. So Pinar now will share some of this information. All right, thank you, Marcos. It's a pleasure to be here. We were here, I think, two years ago, maybe, in Berlin. 
And uh, the research has um, moved on since then, and we have um, a set of findings that don't just relate to banks, but also to, to challenger banks and to fintechs, and some of the things that we see in the market that work less well and therefore should be avoided. So to start with, the, it's pretty clear the reason why we're here and the reason why this is called open banking is that there is a disruption. And there needs to be a disruption. As Ismail also said, uh, innovation has not been the strong suit of the banking sector, and that is why this regulation came about. And that is why um, there's um, all sorts of interesting new players, technology players, fintechs, and all of those guys that we talk to in order to understand what's, what the regulation of open banking has initiated in terms of the, the actual uh, changes in the market. We have been collecting data since 2016, and we've talked to over 100 key stakeholders in the UK and in the EU, um, incumbent banks, challengers, fintechs, as well as uh, various industry experts, in order to understand what some of the challenges are, depending on what kind of a um, stakeholder you are in this market. And today, what we're going to compare for you are the positions of incumbent banks versus challenger banks. In particular, we look at the platform formation efforts of these players. So an incumbent bank can have a platform, um, just like we said in the morning, it could be their own portal, or it can be part of a larger portal. They can outsource the platform, and there are great um, examples of that. Or you can be a new challenger bank, and you could have your own platform. Depending on who you are, these are some of the interesting questions that we have found that these guys um, struggle with. First of all, if you're an established bank, how do I actually build a platform? In terms of my IT, you know, the legacy, as well as how do I understand APIs, how do I publish them, and do I have an incentive to publish them? And what do I put on it? If I have a platform, will I actually put fintechs on it knowing that they will compete with me? Or am I going to be very selective and only go to fintechs that complement my products, knowing that my products may not be the most competitive in the market, but I will still keep them because that's what I have built over the years. On the other hand, if you're a challenger bank, then the questions that are interesting are how do I... Building the platform, these are digital-born guys, right? Building the platform is not the issue. But populating the platform, attracting users, and fintechs is the issue for them. So they have a very different set of challenges ahead of them. And of course, how much of it do I offer myself? Do I just have the current account, the debit account, and then I do savings and mortgages, etc., through a set of fintechs in the, in the spirit of Amazon? Or do I actually try to do as much as possible myself? Because in some of these services, such as lending, that's where the money is, right? So that's a big dilemma for some of the challenger banks as well. Starting with the perspective of incumbent banks, what we see is that incumbent banks have seen themselves and the society has seen them as the fortresses where your data and your assets are protected. And that is now being challenged. Now, in a sense, if you will, open banking is saying, well, we need to take those down and you know, others are gonna access what's inside. And you can also access, you can also have access to the outside world if you wish. But this is a very big challenge for a fortress to, to overcome. More specifically, what we see is that incumbent banks over the years, because they had to add products before, without disrupting their current products, over decades they built IT infrastructures, in a sense towers that are siloed from one another. This was necessary for security purposes for protecting data, and in addition, like also the speakers in the morning said, there are a different set of regulations around each of these different products. So keeping them separate was the right choice for them. And of course, on top of that, if you have all these silos for these different products in terms of IT, then you build your organizational structure around them. What that means is that there's someone sitting on top of each of these towers, and these guys don't talk to one another, and the ITs don't talk to one another. On top of that, being in a highly regulated market, one of the biggest, in a sense, um, dilemmas that they have is that they have approached data as a, this is an actual quote, a biohazardous waste. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, to suddenly think of data as something that shouldn't just be contained and protected from the outside world, to understanding that this is their greatest, and not the money, but the data is their greatest asset, is a big mind shift, which we, a lot of the banks uh, struggle with. In terms
terms of the openness towards bringing competitors onto their platforms, one of the issues that we see, and again, this is an actual quote, is that they don't want their products, meaning their um, you know, portals, to look like NASCAR with all these other logos. So they want their logo to be in the front, and they want to white label as much as possible, only allowing fintechs to have a visibility on their platform if the fintech complements their products, but not if the fintech actually uh, competes with their products. And this creates a situation where fintechs, if they want to work with a bank, then you know, they struggle with how much visibility they can get in the market through the bank. Banks struggle with whether to keep their products, knowing that a lot of fintechs have better AI and better uh, data analysis capabilities that bring prices down, that actually give better risk analysis. How do you actually coexist in a world? Do you stay closed and hope that customers will not switch? But you see that the millennials are starting to switch and they're okay with their data being shared. So there's a big dilemma here in terms of adjusting to the new world. What does this mean for fintechs? A lot of banks have um, hackathons and fintech challenges and you know, they announce the winners, etc. One of the issues that we see is that if you're a winner in one of these competitions, then in a sense the imme immediate reaction is that this is a positive thing. On the other hand, the bank then starts a relationship with you. And this relationship can take many months. Sometimes in order to sign the first contract can take six months. And during that time, they're not giving you any money because you haven't started working with them. So we see one of the biggest dangers for fintechs is that these fintechs end up, if they you know, get close to a bank and hope to work with them, which is the right strategy in the uh, context of getting access to millions of customers, but they actually run the risk of running out of money before they start working with the bank. Now, a completely different story which is challenger banks. Challenger banks are, you know, the new guys, the digital guys, and here are some of their faces. And what they provide are marketplaces. So they bring the Ebays, like Marco said, they bring the Ebays and Amazons of the world into the financial market. They're not concerned about doing everything themselves. They don't have legacy culture and legacy IT, but still they have many other challenges that they need to overcome. Here they are. First of all, they don't have the brand. And while I'm okay buying things from, perfect, three minutes, buying things from Amazon, you know, and, and Amazon sharing my address with the, with the uh, you know, providers of those products, it's actually quite different when you start to share your life savings and you know, all of that data. And so not having a well-known brand is actually making it really difficult for them to get customers. The problem is not just getting the customer to sign up though. They actually have, you know, some of them, the big ones have millions of customers signed up. But those customers are only playing on those accounts, meaning, you know, they put 100 or 200 pounds and then when they go abroad, they use that because the rates are cheaper. But to, to actually put the deposit, the salary and to use pensions and, you know, savings, etc., is something that most customers refrain from just because of the risks. And these risks are actually, you know, in a sense, this fear is justified because these are small entities that their IT actually ends up breaking because they don't have the resources to make it as robust as they possibly could. So there are weekends, for example, in the last two years, all of the challenger bank banks have been down at least two times for more than 24 hours. That means no access to your data, no access to your money. And this is a serious problem. In addition, one of the issues we see is that some of them, as they try to find you know, um, solutions to this. They actually do things like, you know, going from a B2C model to B2B, right? So saying, I'm gonna white label my platform and be part of a bank offering. This is wonderful. However, the bank doesn't change its culture because it's working with you. So it actually is quite difficult to make money in those scenarios as well. Some of them have gone and tried to make deals with energy companies. And these energy companies ended up actually giving them even more headache because they are more archa archaic than the banks. And finally, 
going international is a potential issue because that basket, that Christmas basket that you created with all those nice fintechs on your platform, that actually doesn't transfer over to Germany because a lot of them are, those fintechs are subject to local regulation. So these are some of the issues that we've identified with the challengers. What this gives us in total is a picture which is that fintech startups here on the upper right struggle with getting customers trust and the resources in order to grow. Incumbent banks at the lower right are struggling with shifting to platforms and even if they outsource to platform because they can't do it themselves, their culture doesn't change. What this brings us to is that on the upper left, this gives a huge opportunity to the likes of Amazon and Google to come and take over this market. And this is because the new players, because of the nature of the market, struggle with growing, and the big players are struggling with adjusting and innovating. So, in fact, you know, this, uh, we see signs of this, and uh, one of the um, informers have described this as a, as a musical chairs, where everybody's trying to grab a seat. What we see is that a lot of the tech giants are already in different types of banking services, and this uh, trend is only going to increase, and you know, this, our research basically explains the reasons why. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pina. Any questions for Pina and Marcus? Do I see, uh, there's one, okay. So, Alex Mifsud, Weaver.io. Um, the, the first part of the presentation from Marcus really described the platform model. And the platform model is where they have producers and consumers, and the platform largely gets out of the way. The, what, Pina, what you've described, Pina, doesn't sound at all like that. The, you know, the challenger banks and the banks, they're not getting out of the way. They're very much at the center of the licensing, curating what can be on the platform, are you aware of any actual kind of real platforms that are working in this space? Yeah, so you're absolutely right that when it comes to incumbent banks, they're not getting out of the way and just becoming a platform provider, and that's one of the challenges. The challenger banks are a little bit be better just by nature because they don't have the resources to produce a lot of these things themselves. Marcus, do you know of any ones that are the true platforms compared to... Um, mostly platforms? Well, I, I think this is a business model that we, we've only started to scratch the surface in finance. So I think we're going to see a lot more uh, of, of these kind of, of platforms kind of coming to front. I'm not sure what you mean out of the way, though, because, for example, Amazon or, you know, other bigger platforms, even Uber in these examples, they want to be very central to the interaction. They actually want you to do everything through their app, and what they're doing now is provide more and more services on top of their app. They're reinforcing the brand and the experience and everything. So they actually they want to bring everything together and, and sell it as a package to you with their own kind of identity. Right? So, I mean, getting out of the way may be kind of a slight... Uh, wrong way to put it, but I guess I, I take your point. I think is to be the facilitator, the orchestrator of, of a small economy that you know kind of produces and consumes meat and exchange services and, and transact. Definitely, um, I mean that's something that we need to see in finance more and more. Uh, but I think what we've laid out here is also the challenges of going about and doing that. You know how open you have to be as a platform. So we kind of identify different levels of openness, or when you provide a platform kind of as a technology or, or a stack. You know, do you own it? Do you don't own it? You know, do you license it, etc. So these are kind of the dichotomies or you know the decisions that some of you guys may may need to kind of consider. Folks, we'd be happy to talk about these. Findings. You can talk about it over lunch a bit later. That's all right. <laughs> Big round of applause.